Hello, friends, and welcome to Your Daily Detroit. How are you doing today? It's Wednesday, October 26th, 2022. Coming to you from the Paris of the Midwest, I'm Jair Stays, and across the table from me is... Cheyenne Serini. Good to see you. Great to see you. You know, I've been busy. I know. How was that road trip? You know, there was a lot of walking in Memphis. <laughs> Literally more than 55,000 steps. It was it was good, though. Like, there's a cute trolley. There's, like, a lot of walkable stuff down there. So there was a lot to this trip beyond just the Detroit City FC. Yeah, I know. I was following along on Instagram like you told us to do. So, <laughs> yeah, it looked like a lot of fun. It looked like a lot of really good food and some nice drinks. Engineer Randy found a lot. He definitely found a lot. Also, I would like to mention to people, I got a little bit of inspiration at one of the places I visited. They turned an old train station into a hotel and a great restaurant called The Bishop. The uh, hotel itself is called Central Station Memphis. It's a Hilton. And there's a great bar lobby. But they went with the train theme. They kept all the signage, everything else like that. I've got some inspiration for the new studio because – by the way, listeners, if you've got some old speakers lying around, they don't need to work. I'm trying to put together a little wall of them because I, I love the inspiration from this. But here's the kicker. It's still a train station. Ooh, I know like, how much you love trains. I do. I do. And what I love about it is, is of course, way smaller scale than Detroit. Uh, but it is something where it still has service at the end of a trolley line. And then it ties into the Amtrak with a, a train that goes from Chicago to Memphis, to New Orleans. Oh, wow. Ooh, that would be a fun trip. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Now, it's interesting, although I say smaller scale, and the Memphis region is smaller than Detroit, did you know that Memphis and the city of Detroit are basically the same size as far as population? I did know that, actually, because we talk a lot about population. So much population. And uh, we like to do some comparison around here. But the listeners might not have known that. I was kind of intrigued by that. It was really interesting to see. One thing I liked about Memphis was they did not delete a lot of their old buildings. Now, there's still definitely some storefronts still to fill. There's also some great businesses, some great restaurants, some great coffee shops, some shopping all along Main Street. Basically, there is a trolley that runs from the world's largest Bass Pro Shops. <laughs> Which, of course, Engineer Randy, being from up north, had to go to. I, I saw that out. one, too, and I was like, hmm, okay, that was a choice. And let me tell you, there is an episode coming about duck decoys. Detroit duck decoys. Who knew? Who knew? Obviously, uh, our friend of the podcast, Dan Austin, knows. So He I, knows everything. He knows everything. So I'm excited to get to working on that episode. There's inspiration everywhere. but And I can't speak to the overall tenor of everything for the city because I basically stayed on Main Street. Like from one end of the trolley line to the other. But it was a lot of fun, you know? And I liked it being walkable. You could walk from one end to the other. And me and Randy did a couple of times. Visited various museums. Uh, stopped by uh, the uh, place where Martin Luther King Jr. was assassinated. Like, there's a lot of fun stuff and a lot of history. And, you know, when I was sitting there, I was thinking. And listeners of the show might remember Mickey Lyons. Yes. The barkeologist. I feel like Mickey would do very well in Memphis. I feel like that's her kind of town. I think that would be her kind of town, too. <laughs> <laughs> so while you were away, I was stuck here just holding down the fort. And over on Sunday, I want to say, I was scrolling Facebook mindlessly. And I came across a column by Jason Carr from WDIV Channel 4 saying, enough with the gross points already. He's got this hot take that the gross points should just all be combined and we shouldn't have five different cities because it's silly. Okay. And I mean, his column has actually no like historical references as to why each city in the gross points is named for what it is. It's just a hot take with no substance behind it. But it was so annoying to me. Maybe it's because I'm from Gross Point Park and I grew up there. But <laughs> I was like, well, each city has like a distinct personality. Mm -hmm. And first of all, none of them would want to be combined. No. I mean, it's well, and they actually have population yeah, and tax base. So exactly. They, I mean, I understand like if we were going to make a policy point of view that we need to combine resources and be more effective, I could see that pseudo libertarian way of looking at things but i'm scanning this thing over and it is not that no. whatsoever it's basically a 
great way to like take a whack at the gross points. Yeah. Right. And and it's one of the oldest suburbs that you have for a long time actually was part of Hamtramck Township. Mm-hmm. People might not know. I would also like to say that if we're going to be merging the gross points, how about we bring back the city of Fairview? Yeah. Now, listeners don't know that Jefferson Chalmers area ish was a city called Fairview and in a giant race to get land to control the streetcar system, Detroit annexed all of that. Mm-hmm. And so just imagine what if there was a buffer between Detroit and the Gross Points in its own city? How different would things be? I mean, if we're going to go down this like magical route of <laughs> magical thinking and like take this more than on its face, which is basically a bunch of hot take mercantilism, right? Because mm-hmm. nowadays, and I hate to say this, but a lot of times on social media, the hot take merchant can do very well. Oh, yeah. It's a total clickbait headline. Because, I mean, look, people don't like rich people. Like, a lot of people don't like rich people. And Gross Point is stereotypically known. It's not all. No. But it's stereotypically known as a place full of people with more money than other places. And in general, that is true. But also, like, lots of services work there and things like that. Like, And trust me, not perfect. There's always things that are being wrestled with. But I, I just think that it's uh, funny that Gross Point, yet again, is in people's minds. I remember years ago, it's in people's minds. It always goes in there. Because the little truth is, and I don't know where Jason lives, but the truth is a lot of people who create media – they live in that area. Well, he doesn't live in that area because I read another one of his hot takes and mm. he lives down the lodge. I wonder if this is this rivalry thing, you know, old money versus new money. What? I would. Well, the rest of the region just yeah, kind of watches on exactly. because they're like, huh? I know. But back to the money part and about how the gross points are all just a bunch of rich people. I just have to say I grew up in the Cabbage Patch on Lake Point between Mac and Charlevoix. And my dad was a window washer. And I was a window washer daughter. So I was washing windows for all of these rich people. So I get it. I understand. But like this whole like, oh, the gross points are just a bunch of elite people. No. Come on now. It just rubbed me the wrong way. And then he was on the show this morning talking about it again. And I was just like, I'm going to be on the show tomorrow. So I'm going to talk about this because it really caught me in my craw. I don't know. I don't even live in Gross Point anymore. He did his job. He did his job. Because you're talking because about I'm it. Because I'm talking about it. And I'm sure people will click on the link. And we'll put it in the show notes. But this does open up an opportunity to think about, should Detroit have continued to annex, like if it had been allowed to under state law, continue to annex things and be geographically larger? Like there's some people that say Detroit's too big. There's some people that say it's too small. You know, that should have all these different like areas. Because here's the thing. People say... Okay, well, maybe the gross point should be part of Detroit. Or let's say Ferndale is part of Detroit. Would Ferndale still be Ferndale if it was part of Detroit? No. And so that's why I don't think that argument really holds water because you have so many other factors playing into this. Whether it's race, income, tax levels, schools, like all these different things go in. And if anything we've shown in this region, people are willing to drive a long, long way to work. Mm -hmm. Let me tell you, in Memphis, I did 55,000 steps more than that. I lost a belt loop and my colleague, engineer Randy, lost some weight too, even after eating all the barbecue. Why? (laughs) Because we walked and did things. You know, when you have a region where people are not afraid of driving at all and there are no natural borders to hold you in, I don't know if annexation would have actually done the trick. Well, I mean, I think if you look at it and you look at places like Hamtramck, that's smack dab in the middle of the city of Detroit. And you can even see the like, the line between Hamtramck and Detroit, mm-hmm. especially in like in the southern sec, is very easy to tell. Yeah. Like the second you get into the city. Yeah. Now, if the people there wanted to save some money, I mean, I get it. Like the gross points put together a little bit north, I think, of 20,000 people. Mm-hmm. I could understand it practically being one. Like I could understand saving some money and doing that if that's something that they wanted to do. But I don't think there's any way you're ever going to force them together, especially because they have the resources to pay for it. I mean, that's that's the thing is like this consolidation stuff tends to happen between municipalities when everybody's broke. Right. And although Gross Point is not all rich, it's also not broke. And there are some that are far better off than others. That's the other thing. Like Gross Point Shores is very different than Gross Point City and Gross Point Park. Exactly. And that's the thing. They don't want to be combined. No. They want to be in the shores. You buy a property in Gross Point Shores because you want to live in Gross Point Shores and everything that comes with 
I mean, and that's a red part of town. Exactly. Now Gross Point Park votes blue. Exactly. It's a very different microcosm within those five cities. That's why I think his, it's not even an argument. His hot take is stupid. <laughs> <laughs> but three points to him because we talked about it. Yes, exactly. All right. Let's talk about something I actually used to live down the street from. The Brother Nature Farm may be able to actually buy some land that they're on. Oh, that's exciting. This has been a long time disagreement in the city of Detroit. What should be the vision, right? All these square mileage, but what to put there? And a lot of administration officials over the years, not just Duggan, have not been very friendly to urban farms because they kind of look at it as the lowest use of the land. Right. Right. If you're doing like trees and hoop houses and stuff, you're not doing development that brings in a ton of tax money. On the other hand, you're also not costing the city a ton of money because you're maintaining it instead of the city having to do it. Exactly. So Bridge Detroit reports that they might actually be able to get 10 lots near their farming operation for a little bit north of $70,000. They've been going after this for years. The city's refused to sell it as part of their like land bank program. I'm very curious about how this will go because the vote is going to have to go before council because it's so many properties. And is this going to mark a change in policy? Because there have been a number of urban farms in the city that, frankly, the administration has not been very kind to when it comes to owning the land. Fine, do it for a while. Right. But when we want to put a development there, I want that land has been a lot of the thought. The other thing is that this land, you can see Michigan Central Station from here. Yeah. Right? So it's something where if you see a hot residential thing happening nearby, I could see people saying, well – you know, we should develop that land, whatever. They try to put, apparently, according to the Bridge article, they try to put some caveats on it and, like, how long they have to hold it before they sell it, all this other kind of stuff. I don't know. There's part of me that's like, I'd rather see land go into productive use for a while. If there's something I learn, it will, could tie into the, the trip to Memphis for a little bit. I'm realizing more and more Detroit needs to kind of rebuild its engine as far as developing things. And maybe we need to go back down to that level again in some areas. And I want to say down in a negative way, but when you're talking about land use, it's like a scale. Right. I would rather have that than it be on the city's coffers to be taken care of or just turn to something that's just squatted or something like that. Like, at least then it's a productive use. And then maybe down the line, it might end up getting developed in the future because the only thing that's constant in a city is change. Bottom line, even if you are optimistic, there's not a million people moving back into the city any, into the city of Detroit anytime soon. The land is there. We may as well use it if people show a track record, especially like this couple has that own it, of being involved in the area. Let's take it back to the ribbon farms, right? What Detroit started on mm -hmm. of farming, and then we can build from there. One of these things is, is that they're already utilizing this land. And they're already doing things with it. Like this is very different than, say, a Hans Farm situation yeah. where skeptics to that say there was basically a land grab to plant some trees on and then get it, you know, sell it off back into the system later. That's what skeptics say. Other yeah. people say, well, it's somebody who's rich who wants to make a profit, but also takes that land off of the being the city's responsibility, which costs taxpayers all the time, constantly in maintenance and upgrades. Right. Or and, up they're, upkeep. and they're keeping those plots of land kept up. They're making sure people aren't dumping on them, and they're keeping them maintained. Right. And I see both sides of this argument. Exactly. Right? I do, but too. But this is different than that because these are active users that are right there that, like, you see them at Easter Market every week. They also provide produce for, like, chartreuse and folk. You know, like, restaurants actually buy their produce. So it's a legitimate company. I'm curious what listeners have to think. DailyDetroit at gmail.com or hit our contact form. You can find that in the show notes. Do you think we should embrace urban farming more? I think there's a lot of things that we could do with it. Maybe we could even use farming to create some of that density that we need, mm -hmm. you know, so that we don't feel like we have to fill up every single piece of land with development. What are your thoughts? DailyDetroit at gmail.com. So, Jer, are you ready for the holidays yet? No. <laughs> we aren't even to Halloween yet. I don't feel like I'm enough Halloweened in. <laughs> there is a deathologist outside the front door, which is very nice when you, when you walk by, like offers you like he's an animatronic. So I appreciate that. But I don't feel like I'm Halloweened enough at this point. And we're not even to Thanksgiving. And you know how I like me some like macaroni and cheese and green bean casserole that I make. It's a good one. Don't don't let people fool you. A lot of green bean casserole is not good. I promise you, friends, mine is decent. But 
We're not even there yet. And then Christmas? I know. What? So holidays don't start until after my birthday, which is Devil's Night. So, you know, we're not there yet. But it doesn't mean that we can't start looking ahead to all things downtown and the Bedrock family. You know, they like to put on a party. They like to put on some events like Decked Out Detroit. And uh, they announced what they're doing this year for the holidays. So that's going to be in the space near Campus Martius, right? They like do a movie. Sometimes they do a drive-in movie theater there. They also did like a roller yeah. rink experience or something. Like they do a bunch of stuff like that, right? Yeah. So this is so the same gonna, space? Yeah. It's going to be in the Monroe blocks midway, you okay. know. This year, which is different from like previous years, usually decked out Detroit is in like Cadillac Square Campus Martius, which is, I mean, it's all like it's across the street, right? Like It's, it's all near each other. It's all near each other. So it's opening November 11th, and it's going through January 29th. So nice, long chunk of time. Mm -hmm. And this year, they're going to have winter bumper cars. Bumper cars sound interesting. Especially in the cold, but I'm down. I'm down. Yeah, I'm down. I'm I'm interested to see what the vision is. I would like to subscribe to your newsletter and learn more. (laughs) Right. They are going to have an Arctic slide, which is going to be a 20-foot high slide that is 80 feet long. Okay. Are we trying to beat the winter blast here? I kind of feel like this is like a long winter blast. Like a, okay, you left the city. It's reminding me of an ex who is like, well, I could do better than you. And so they go and get the hotter guy. This is what they're trying to do, isn't it? (laughs) This is what they're trying to do. So <laughs> they're trying to make the colder guy in this case, maybe? I don't know. So the Arctic slide is going to have intertubes. Uh, then they're going to do a puck putt. All right. Which is like putt putt, but instead of a golf ball, you are using a hockey puck. And instead of a golf club, you're using a hockey stick. How very Canadian of them. Very Canadian. I don't know if it's on ice or not, but if it is, I'm not going to be participating. But if it isn't, I'm in. Exactly. I am not coordinated enough to be on ice skates. What other kind of midway would it be without some uh, midway arcade? So they're going to have like air hockey and racing games and all kinds of stuff for like playing games. And then I assume they're going to have all like the... Like it's Christmassy, so yeah. I'm gonna assume there's gonna be like the Santa Claus stuff. Yeah, Santa Claus like will the be food there. Food stuff, and what's interesting here, and you sent me this in the the show notes. Uh, I don't see mention of shopping, Cheyenne. It's a little different. I did not see any mention of shopping either. And is that going to be announced differently, or is this separate? Or I'm curious. I don't know. Maybe our folks at Bedrock could let us know because I do find it kind of interesting that they don't have the shopping listed in there because usually they do. But it's a little bit of a different spot, right? Because yeah. Cadillac Square is not the Monroe block. Like, it's next to each other. Yeah. So that's why I'm thinking maybe it's a separate thing and then it's all connected because, you know, it's right across the street. Mm-hmm. Who knows? And usually they have, like, the Cadillac Lodge where you can go and get drinks and hot cocoa and take pictures and all that kind of stuff. So I'm really interested to find out if they are actually bringing back shopping because that was a big thing. Yeah. According to their website, they're going to be – uh, running this kind of three different time frames, you're going to want to go to deckedoutdetroit.com to check that. Basically, until the middle of December, it's going to be running Thursday through Sundays. Mm-hmm. And then it's going to be running all seven days a week until the end of December. And then in January, it's going to be running Fridays and Sundays. So this is going to be interesting. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to check it out. And if you've got an idea of where you want to go or an idea to do something for the holidays – dailydetroit at gmail.com. All right, that is it for today's show. Cheyenne, so good to see you. It was great to see you. Welcome back to the Motor City. I am definitely glad to be back. A little bit in coming attractions. I have an expert from the Citizens Research Council of Michigan coming to help unpack the three ballot proposals in a nonpartisan way to help you understand what you're voting on a little bit better. That'll be great to do. Get your your brains expand a little bit. Do your civic duty of democracy. And then, of course, as always, on Friday, Devin O'Reilly, Man About Town. Because what would be Fridays without Devin? Yeah, it sounds like fun. Programming note, Fletcher Sharp will be back next week just because of the trip and timing and everything else. We also wanted to give it like a week to settle in before we did like 
the DCFC talk, like final for the season thing. Now we're going to do some like hot stove league stuff as well, but that's going to be occasional. A note with that is going to be, we will be switching more into Pistons coverage. Kind of pick that as our sport with Fletcher. Uh, If you've got feedback or things that we should talk about, as I said, dailydetroit at gmail.com. All right, with that, I'm Jer Stays. And I'm Cheyenne O'Serini. Remember that you are somebody, and we'll see you around Detroit.